This morning, we are going to recognize two teams that are going out. And in a few moments, we're going to gather around them for a few moments and pray for them. Um, and we're going to pray for them not only this morning in this worship service, they're going to come down front and we're going to pray for them, but we also are going to pray for them over these next few weeks while they're away. They are going to people that many of us regularly pray for already, to missionaries that are long-term on the field. But this morning, I thought it was very, very important that you as a Christian be informed a little more about how you can be involved with the world that is around us, and in fact, obey this command of Jesus to take the gospel and to preach the gospel around the world. Every time that you come and that you give to our offering, you are in part sending missionaries, because we have 3,800 Southern Baptist missionaries around the world that we keep there with all of their children, another 3,800 people, that's actually more than that, so we are sustaining the proclamation of the gospel to some of the hardest to reach areas. And that's one of the things I'm so thankful for, for our Southern Baptist IMB, the International Mission Board. We are going not to the kind of the easy picking fruit. We are now going to the hardest areas of the world that have yet to hear the gospel. Um, going to the peoples of the world that seem in some cases to be most resistant because we know God has people there. As Matthias was saying just a moment ago, not all have come yet. God still has others that he is bringing to himself. And some of those are behind the wall of Islam. Some of those are behind the wall of communism. Some of those are behind the wall of Hinduism. And so we are continuing to preach the gospel to some of the hardest places of the world, either, either philosophically and ideologically, or even, as Matthias is showing us, even the physical barriers, the physical barriers of oceans and forests and, and distances that are not covered by road, um, we are called to take the gospel and preach the gospel to all of creation. And so we are sending a group today, um, or this week, um, that is going to be doing that in one area of Europe, directly engaging Muslims, and we're going to be sending another group that has a very, very different task. Um, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. This morning, I want us to start, though, with the Apostle Paul. And these next couple of minutes, I think, will be pretty interesting to you. Let's remember who the Apostle Paul is. Notice right there next to the Apostle Paul, it says, let's read these words out loud together that describe him, all right? Are you, do you see they're starting off with missionary? So well, let's read them out loud. What does it say there? Missionary, preacher, teacher, church planter, pastor, discipler. Now, there's other things that he was, but we see in the Scripture that he, first of all, is this idea of a missionary. He's going to take the gospel to people who do not have it. He is a preacher of the gospel. He stands up and says, hey, everybody, the guy that you crucified, this was God in the flesh. This was the Messiah whom you put to death. Peter is preaching that. The apostle Paul is preaching that. We see in in Acts chapter 13, this picture of Paul standing up and proclaiming the gospel to Jews, and many of them going, wow, this is, who he, this is who God is. This was the plan of God's salvation. We see that he's a preacher of the gospel, but we also see that he's a patient teacher, teaching day in and day out, month in and month out, year in and year out to various churches and groups of people. He's a church planter. He's establishing churches, finding leaders, establishing those leaders, making sure that they have the gospel carefully. And then notice this, he's also a discipler. It's funny, um, any of your word checks will not allow the word discipler. It'll have a little squiggly line underneath it. Um, but Christians like the word discipler. It is someone who makes disciples, someone who teaches others. And so this was the Apostle Paul. It's interesting. Notice this. First of all, Saul was a Jew among Jews and a persecutor of the church before his conversion. So we need to remember that, that the Apostle Paul, the one who would give us so much of the New Testament through the power of the Holy Spirit and by the leadership of that, the design of God, the Apostle Paul was once an opposer, a great opposer, someone that would even drag Christians off to be persecuted. 
In fact, he stood there the day the very first martyr, Christian martyr, died. He held the coats of those who stoned Stephen to death, and he was in hearty agreement with that. So this was truly a persecutor of the church. Some people say, I don't know if God can forgive me. I don't know for the things that I've done. I I don't know if God would forgive me. I don't know if God can use me because of the things that I've done. Well, I just ask you, have you put Christians to death? I just ask you, have you been in hearty agreement of those who are hating those who love God? If the Apostle Paul can be used by the Holy Spirit, by the grace of God, you can be used by the Holy, by the Holy Spirit, by the grace of God. So, notice the second one there, Acts chapter 13 and 14, is his first missionary journey with Barnabas. And it's during this missionary journey that he senses God's call to go to the Gentiles. So, it's not, the gospel is not just for Jewish people who were the chosen people of God through whom the blessing of the Messiah would come, but it was also for those who were non-Jews to the Gentiles. That was a very monumental moment for a Jew among Jews, a guy who was trained as one of the highest teaching Jews of his day, that he would turn to Gentiles and take the gospel. Here we see the grace of God in that. Look at the third bullet point there. Paul went on at least three missionary journeys and a final trip to Rome. Now, there are some hints in the New Testament that he went to a lot of other places as well, not just the track that is, that is given there, but there's hints here and there that he went to other cities outside the chronology of what we see in the list of his, of his track. And so, he did a lot of traveling for that day and time. In fact, I think you'll find this very interesting. During this time, Paul wrote 13 of the 27 total books of the New Testament. So, here we are. He writes half the New Testament that you and I enjoy, half of the books of the New Testament. We see him being used by God to pen. Most of you look at the maps of Paul's missionary journeys, and you're sitting there, okay, this is the green one, this is the blue one, this is the yellow one, which journey was this? Which and it's, it looks very confusing until you study the book of Acts a little bit, and you see the guy is all over the modern world of that day. He's all over the Mediterranean. He's traveling back and forth decade after decade, sailing, walking, you name it, he's going. Notice here with me, he travels 10,000 miles by foot. And during that time, he traveled 6,000 miles by ship. Now, ship was more expensive. It was faster, but it was more expensive. Both were dangerous. We see in the Scriptures that he accounts that if I was walking through the highlands, you know, when you get into mountain areas, that's where you get in trouble. There's bandits, and there's robbers, and there's, there's all kinds of weird things that, that people, as you're going through passes and as you're going through the mountain ravines and everything else, that there's fraught with danger in that. Not only is there danger in that, but he's on ships. And in the Mediterranean world, they didn't have Noah. They didn't have Noah. No, sorry, that's not like Noah the the, the uh, ark builder, they didn't have the National Oceanic uh, Atmospheric Administration to keep up with the weather movements and the radar, Doppler radar, and all of the history of all of our studying of weather movements. They didn't have all of that. So, ship travel was very dangerous. In fact, the Mediterranean world, uh, you, you just go out in the Mediterranean, you start digging around in the, in the bottom of the Mediterranean, and you very often find ships and the ancient artifacts that are there because so many ships were sunk um, over those thousands of years. Um, so, this was, both of these were very dangerous things to do that he did willingly, readily, gladly, in, in fact, enduring shipwreck three times. Notice the next one there. He traveled, just as travel days, he traveled over 650 days in a 20-year period. Now, when I was with the IMB, I had a lot of travel days, and I'd be going from one continent to another or going from one city to another, and, you know, traveling is exhausting. Um, I, I, just, I, I just remember those days I would finally get home and collapse very often after being gone for days or weeks. 
um, at a time and long travel schedules, waiting, uh, especially in Africa, you wait a lot, don't you, Matthias and Karen? You wait a lot. And uh, waiting for, high, you know, high-energy people is an exhausting experience uh, very often um, for me, especially when I'm impatient. But 650 days of travel. Now, look at the next part here. Over 500 of those days he was walking. The average walking day was typically about 20 miles. I kind of have a feeling that Paul got a few more miles in than most people. He probably was above average in that just because of his spirit and his injury until he got older and maybe not. Um, but look at that map again and just kind of think about that. 10,000 miles by foot, 6,000 miles um, by ship, and uh, multiple trips, many perils, and much difficulty, all because he's taking the gospel along with others and discipling them to do that. Now, in this period of time, he also spent four to five years in prison or in custody. Now, imagine that. Not only is he going through all of these hardships, in fact, even being stoned and left for dead at one point, and uh, the Lord raising raising him up out of that. They they carried him out of the city and left him for dead, and his friends called, gathered around him, and it says, Paul stood up, woke up, went back into the city, um, and ready to roll. I mean, not only those difficulties, but four to five years in prison, and it was in the prison times when he wrote many of his letters. All of this is going to be helpful to us in uh, the next couple of months as we study a new um, Pauline letter of the New Testament, but four to five years in prison. And then notice this also, Paul was beheaded in Rome by Nero. So the Bible doesn't tell us that, but Christian history tells us that there was, under the great persecution of Nero and all of his insanity and insecurity, he came after those who were leading any type of movement that was not in subservice to him. And uh, in fact, he was beheaded by that. So all of this causes us to look and see in the letters of Paul, I want you to notice this morning, these calls for prayer. He is saying as the first great missionary, and there's been many, many great missionaries since him over the last 2,000 years, but we see in his writings the interaction that is required with the people of God who are sending out missionaries, obeying the Great Commission. You see, it's not just Paul who's obeying the Great Commission. It's the church at Antioch that sends him out, that comes and and helps him get going, that comes and gives the money and supports in prayer, and in fact sends people to join him and sends the next young couple or the next young guy or the next young gal to the place where he's left in order to go help with the work that is left behind. You see, it is the church that is involved in this mission. In fact, the most brief one here is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 25. And I'd like to ask you to circle that whole thing, 1 Thessalonians 5, 25, and the, sin, and the, the whole verse after it. Let's read it out loud together. What does it say there? It says, brothers, pray for us. Here we are at the end of the book of Thessalonians. He's writing to the people of Thessaloniki, and he's saying to them, pray for us. Pray for us. You're a Christian. You're a brother in Christ. You're a sister in Christ. Pray for us. Do you pray for missionaries? When was the last time you really prayed for someone who is preaching the gospel in a far-off place? Is that part of your prayer life? What is in your prayer life? When you pray, what is the main substance of your prayers? Is it about your sin, confession of your sin? I hope so. We constantly need to come before God, agreeing with Him about our sin. There's no doubt about that. But that must not be the only thing that we pray. 
I hope that it's that you pray in praise and adoration of God, that you remember who he is and you exalt him and remember and declare, as we've sung, ascribe greatness to our God, as we've started this service with, remembering his holiness, the fact that he is set apart from the rest of the world, and that's what gives us hope, that he's not like us. He can rescue us out of ourselves in a fallen world. But do we pray for missionaries? I want you to see how important this is. And I pray that this message over the next few minutes helps you adopt a commitment, helps you inculcate this into your life and into your prayer life that this becomes important to you. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 2. We see there in verse 1, it says, Finally, brethren, pray for us, there it again, that the word of the Lord will spread rapidly and be glorified. So now he's, he's not just saying pray for us, and the rest of these are going to show us what to pray, the kinds of things we ought to pray. Pray for us that the word of the Lord will spread rapidly and be glorified, just as it did also with you. He's saying, you receive the gospel. Pray that others will receive the gospel and that we will be rescued from perverse and evil men, for not all have faith. So he knows that he's going to go into circumstances where people are going to reject the gospel, they're going to reject him and the message of the gospel, and they are going to seek to destroy him. And yet he says, pray that the word will go, and as we go, that God will protect us from these that are opposed. Look at Romans chapter 15 and verse 30 and 30, 30 through 32. He says in verse 30, I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, what does it say there underlined? Let's read it out loud. To strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf. Would you circle those words, to strive together with me? To strive together with me. You see, he's calling them to join him. He's calling them to partner with him. He's saying, come, stay with me, serve with me through your prayer. Look at verse 31, that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea and that my service for, Jer for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. Verse 32, so that by God's will, I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. Not only so the gospel will prosper and I will be protected, but I'll be able to come back and share fellowship with you. Look at 2 Corinthians verse one, chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. And I love this one. And this one really spoke to me this week. And I want you to see this. And, and this can bring so much hope to you amidst affliction. Amidst affliction in your life, amidst difficulty in your life, and even ministry in the church. And for these missionaries that are, that are going out, that this can be so encouraging. Look what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9 through 11. Verse 8 says this, and I'm going to back up to verse 8. It says, For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. See, there's hardship in missions. For we were so utterly be burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. My friends, that's pretty grandiose struggle. Look at verse 9. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. See, so he saw the reason for the afflictions and the hardships so they wouldn't depend upon themselves. That's God in his grace. You say, well, why didn't he deliver them out of this, this trouble that made them think that they were just going to die in this? And it was so that the greater purposes of God helping us to see that we, want, we need him in the process. It's not all about us. Look in the middle of that verse. It says, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Verse 10, he delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. Now, that's speaking of our salvation. Paul was beheaded eventually. But he knew that his great deliverance was not out of the hands of someone that after they've killed you, they've done all that they can do. He knows that his greatest deliverance is from sin and death and the curse of sin to hell. 
He is delivered into the hands of a saving God. That he will deliver us. Look at the next part. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. You see, there it is, after death. Verse 11, for also must help, excuse me, you also must help us in prayer. Here's the request. You also must help us in prayer so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted to us through the prayers of many. You see, prayer is playing a key role in the work of missions in Paul's life. Look at Ephesians chapter 6, verses 18 through 20. And this is just after the, the section that gives the spiritual armor that we are to put on. And at the end of that section, talking about the breastplate of righteousness, feet shod with the gospel, helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit of the Word of God. Look, notice this, he says, and then also, verse 18, praying at all times in the Spirit. Now, that doesn't mean glossolalia. That doesn't mean speaking in tongues in an unknown language. It is saying praying that your prayer is in line with what Christ has called us to do, being led by the Holy Spirit in your prayer. Notice here, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for the saints. So he's saying praying for Christians, verse 19, and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. Look what he's asking them to pray for, that words will be given to me, that I'll be able to share the gospel boldly. Verse 20, for which I'm ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. So missionaries are asking, oh, pray that God would make us bold. Pray that God would make us clear about the gospel. Look at Philippians chapter 1 in verse 19 and 20. It says, yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers... Through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. As it is my eager expectation and hope, I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. You see, he was always aware that death was there. There was, there was never a fear in this. He was simply wanting the gospel to be clear, and that whether he lived or whether he died, that Christ would be honored. Look at Colossians 4, 2 through 4. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. So it's glorifying to God that we are thankful as we ask. Look at verse 3. At the same time, here it is, Pray also for us, that God may open to us a door for the word. I love this verse. There's many times I have made this a key prayer of mine. Lord, open the door for the word. You know, when you start praying, Lord, give me an opportunity. Open a door for me to be able to speak the word of Christ. It's amazing. That is one of the most answered prayers that we can ever pray for. Why? Because God wants us to speak the words of Christ. That's why he's left you here as a Christian, is to be able to tell people who don't know about him, to be able to start to join him in his message of seeking and saving the lost. We see this. Look at what it says there, to declare the mystery of Christ. It's truly a beautiful mystery that Christ would come and lay down his life for us. An account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. You see, he wanted it to be clear. Philemon chapter 22, or verse 22, just a simple little chapter of the Bible written to an individual, and we see the heart of Paul in this. He says, at the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I'm hoping that through your prayers, I will be graciously given to you. And so, somewhere along the way, he's praying that I'm gonna be able to make it back home to you and be able to be with you, and this is a prayer. And he saw it as through those requests. How beautiful. There are four things that God-glorifying prayer does. Now, notice that I put on here God-glorifying prayer. I didn't just put on here prayer does these things. 
I believe that in this present day and time, we need to be very, very careful to be God-centered. You see, even talking about prayer can actually, in a subtle way, become us-centered. We can start thinking and talking about the spiritual discipline of prayer. We can, we can kind of forget a little bit about what prayer really is. We think it's by saying these words, saying these words, I'm disciplined to say these words. We, we need to be very careful not to edge over into that religiosity. You see, prayer is very relational. True prayer is a conversation. True prayer is communication with someone. It's not just communication with the air. It's not just a discipline that you are exercising. No, it is communion with God. And so God-glorifying prayer, true prayer, prayer that brings glory to God is prayer that is, that is true and real based upon his word. And so I just want to encourage you that it's not prayer that changes things. It is the God to whom we pray that changes things. That's an important thing for us to remember, that it's not your religious act that is going to bring about the blessing as so much as it is in the context of our discipline and prayer is coming before a holy God and coming before him with a gladness of heart, praying the things that he has shown us to pray and the things that are bringing glory to him. And so, number one, God-glorifying prayer brings real partnership in mission work. We've just read this. It brings real partnership in mission work. Look at Romans 15 and verse 30. I appear to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, there it is, you circled this on the other side, to strive together with me. You see, that's partnership. That is joining him, to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf. It's not your religious prayers, but it's your prayers to God, speaking to God on his behalf, petitioning God, putting faith and expressing faith and gratitude to God on his behalf. We can also see it in 2 Corinthians and in Philippians 1.19. Number two, God-glorifying prayer brings real power to mission work and in mission work. This is where the power is because it's not in our strength. And don't you remember the passage that we just looked at, 2 Corinthians 1, 9 through 11? They went through all of this difficulty in order to see that it didn't rely upon their strength, but it went, they went through this bringing them down in their estimation of themselves in order to see the God who raises the dead. Here we thought we were going to die, but we learned we don't have anything to fear because this is the God who raises the dead and we're serving him. So even the Apostle Paul had to be reminded of that, apparently, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, he's describing this. And so the real power is when God is moving, not when we are moving. Ultimately, it is him. Now, he moves through us, and he uses us, and he works in us. But you can go out and work very hard, and God not be in the work, and it brings nothing. But when God is in the work, and it's our prayer that is recognizing that God comes and does it. In fact, Jesus would say these words in John 15, 5, and these verses just latched into my heart as a late teenager uh, when I was 18 or 19 years of age and really started walking with the Lord. John 15 began to mean much to me. And it's where Jesus says, you know, be in the vine, I am the vine, you are the branches, stay in me and let my word stay in you, abide in me and I will abide in you. And then he goes on and he says in John 15, 5, for apart from me, underline it, what? You can do nothing. You see, there's nothing of true importance that is going to be done apart from him. So the real power comes through prayer, abiding in God. Look at number three. God-glorifying prayer brings real protection in mission work. And we see this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 2. He is calling on them to pray that we will be rescued from perverse and evil men, for not all have faith. 
I was thinking about, my goodness, which stories to tell about how God has answered this in Marcy and in my life, and how there are um, hundreds, thousands of stories throughout missionary work of how God was answering the prayers of the saints for missionaries in far-off places, or the missionaries themselves praying and God bringing about a protection. A very serious event um, occurred when I was uh, leading. Um, Several years ago, we had great opposition at the port gates. There were some people really giving us a very, very hard time. And many of you know that there's, we're about six hours ahead of the And there was one particular summer that we had a guy whose name was Jamel who would come down and oppose us at the gates as we were seeking to share the gospel with people at the port gates of people getting on the ships to go back to Africa. And it went on and it went on and it went on and it came kind of to a big showdown. And I will never forget that as we prayed as teams and as we we were really dealing with this, um, I had to go and deal with this guy in, his, in his, all of his opposition, and I got back to the hotel after that, and I got a phone call from my dad. And he said, Andrew, in the middle of the night, I woke up thinking about you. You see, we were six hours ahead of him. And he said, the Lord just had me praying for you. What's going on? And I thought, wow, God came and was working through the prayers. I want you to know that Jamel stopped his opposition and actually began listening to the gospel. And in a matter of months later, with other missionaries in Aix-en-Provence, started going to a Protestant church. Now, what if the people of Sheridan Hills and the people of other places had not been praying? I believe that God answered their prayers at the hands of evil men seeking to intervene. Told about an individual was, that was really stopping their work in Sudan. This official was coming and stopping against them. Every time they would go to a new city, he would come and he would send army people to stop their work. He would, he would prohibit them from traveling. He would do all of these things, and he was always wanting money, wanting money, wanting money. He was a bit of a warlord. And Mark and Kathy were were really struggling with this, and they said, Lord, the work is stopped because of this guy. Lord, do something. Do whatever it takes. Do whatever it takes to stop this man from stopping the God, hindering the gospel from going forward. They had a very serious prayer time, several missionaries together, and they said, Lord, we don't know what you're going to do, but we just ask that you would do it. The next day, the man died in a sandstorm. And the story, when Mark told that story here seven years ago, we, we were just shocked. And he told it in tears, saying the power of God is great. And he has a plan in the world, and he can do whatever he needs to do. Will we pray? Number four, God-glorifying prayer brings real progress. In mission work, God-glorifying prayer brings real progress in mission work. Colossians 4, 3 says, Lord, open a door. 2 Thessalonians 3, 2 says, notice this, for us that pray for us, that the word of the Lord, underline that, will spread rapidly and be glorified. You see, it is prayer that opens the door for the gospel, and it is prayer that by God's answering it, that causes the gospel to spread rapidly. It's one of the elements that is involved in mission work. I want to be careful to say it's one of the elements. God can do whatever He wants to do, but He is glorified when we pray and when we ask Him. Now, this morning we're going to pray for some things, and and many people would say, well, pastor, I would pray more for missions if I knew what to pray. Well, do you see these things that are here below? I'm going to help you just start. I'm going to help you with just a few things. And as I go through these things, in just a few moments when we pray, there may be something on here that you say, I can pray for that. I will will pray for that. 
Um, I, or maybe there might be several things here in your own prayer time at home that you begin, you, God lays one of these things on your heart. And I'm, I'm praying even right now as I'm preaching this, that God will lay different things on your heart to think about and pray for, for these two teams that are going out that are here. I want us to see the first team, specific prayer. Now, many of you have heard of and here is the team that's going out. We're sending several, and they'll be leaving, I believe, on Friday um, for this. But what is Let's look and see. Every year, Campus Crusade for Christ, as well as the International Mission Board, come together to distribute Bibles to North Africans. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just, we're, I'm not going to show the video. I just want to, I want us to just see and understand what it is that they're doing. There's a bunch of of North African immigrants that live in Europe. And every year during the summertime, they like to go home to North Africa to see their family and friends and to take supplies. So they get on ships, these huge ferry ships that you see here, and they go out of the port and they go all the way across the Mediterranean. Well, this is an opportunity as they go through those car gates to go on board the ship, they have to show their papers and they have to show that the car is allowed to go to Africa. And while they are there, we are there at the port gates offering them a packet that has the gospel in it. Notice this packet right here. On the top of it is a French and Arabic Bible. And this French and Arabic Bible is the New Testament Bible. Inside of this, there are numerous videos that are here, and there's even a children's book that is here, all that explains the Bible, all explains the gospel. And so here we are in our 17th or 18th year of doing this project. There are people there that are ready to hand off the, the packet um, explaining the gospel. So you can imagine that there's some people that really love that. There's some cars that they come up, and there's also pedestrians, not only cars. There's people that go through the pedestrian gates, and most of the time those are women. And so we will send people down to the pedestrian gates. Now think about it with me. These packets are the only source of a large volume of Bibles into North Africa. Um, over 27,000 packets per, sum, per um, summer, very often through one city of loan. And, and, it's, and it's several pieces that are here. Now, they may take the packet apart and leave behind part of it and take what it is that they want. But this is a very strategic way to share the Word of God in a language that they can read or understand in this way. So, what do you pray for our team that's going to Project Northern Lights? Alex is already there. Talked to him last night. They've had days of distribution. Listen to this. Alex shared the gospel with an Arabic French-speaking man yesterday, and the man spoke no English. So he had the, the, the uh, gospel track in the language, and he sim simply was pointing, 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 pointing. He said, now read this. Read this, read this. The man reads the whole gospel and takes it with him as he leaves. So there's Alex. He doesn't speak a, a word of French other than bonjour. And then he's sharing the gospel with someone that's there. So how can we pray for them? Number one, pray for God to open a door. Open a door to share the mystery of Christ. That's Colossians 4.3. We always need to pray for an open door, that God would open the doors. Number two, pray for boldness. This is a big one. This is what we see throughout the book of Acts, and we see this throughout the letters. Boldness. We need to pray for boldness to share the gospel amidst intimidating circumstances. Number three, we need to pray for God to give divine appointments. This is where God has orchestrated time and space for a particular moment where he has someone who's ready to hear the gospel. And he is arranging their trip down from Belgium all the way down to southern France, and he schedules the boat, and he schedules one of our volunteers or one of our workers to be there. And at the right moment, when he pulls up to the gate, it's the right situation, and God has divinely met that moment with an opportunity. Number four, Pray for the seeds of the gospel to be sown in good soil. You remember there's four soils, and there's only one that is good soil. One of the things that we pray for is, Lord, give us good soil. 
Number five, pray that God's word, pray for God's word to instantly, radically change hearts. You know, God in a moment can take the hardest heart and melt it, and he is glorified when we pray for him to do that. This is Saul's turned to Paul's. If he can do it with Saul, he can do it with Jamel, and he can do it with my friend Adel, which he did. Notice the next one here. Number six, pray for bodily strength and stamina for our team to do the exhausting work. This is hard work out in the sun. They have to walk a lot. When they're not at the port gates because there's no ships, they're going out into the Muslim neighborhoods. This is bodily strength is something that they need and stamina. Now, you've never prayed for number seven before. I'll guarantee you, you've never prayed for number seven. But now you can pray for it. Pray for traffic jams at the port gates. Pray for traffic jams. Why pray for traffic jams? That stop the cars so the packets can be um, distributed or offered. It's hysterical. There'll be some guy at the gate that his papers are all wrong, and all the cars stack up as long as and as far as you can see, and our team is going, oh, thank you, God. And then we're, they're stuck. They can't go anywhere. So you're sitting there, and you walk up to the car, and you say, salam alaikum. And they go, oh, no, no, no. And you go, it's a gratuit. It's free. It's free. It's free. This is for your family. You say, c'est gratuit. C'est pour votre famille. C'est, c'est gratuit. C'est l'évangile. C'est pour tout le monde. This is for everyone. This is for everyone. And it's free. Um, it's amazing that some people will go, gratuit? <laughs> like, free? They thought we were selling it. And we can say, totalement gratuit. What does that mean? Totally free. And they're like, okay. But if you don't have those seconds to do that, to overcome that opposition of, I'm not buying, I'm not buying, just leave me alone. Then you have the moment to say to them, this is free, and it's the gospel. Say l'evangile, the good news of Christ. So pray for traffic jams. You've never prayed for that before, but you can. Number eight, pray for helpful police and port officials. Some of the police and port officials can say, get out of here. We don't want you here um, in the midst of the traffic. Um, But other ones are like, hey, I think it's pretty great. You're witnessing the Muslims. Hang around. Um, They kind of think it's funny. I've had big, huge traffic cops come up with their boots on, on the motorcycles and everything, and they're sitting there watching us with their sunglasses on and their helmets on, and they're just watching the whole thing. And I thought, he's coming over here to shut us down. And he walked over to me with his big, you know, intimidating thing, and he said, can I have one? <laughs> and I said, sure. Yeah, this is for you. It's gratuit. It's free, you know. And he's like, great. And then he went over and he put it in the side saddle of his big motorcycle. And then he walked back over to him and he goes, can I have another one? And I said, yes. How many do you want? It's free. So pray for helpful police and port officials. Um, That is a good thing for you to pray this morning. Number nine, um, pray for protection from those who hate the gospel. Um, There is opposition, and there's people that really want to stop us. Um, Number 10, pray for our team members that they will experience lifelong growth from this experience. So I want to encourage you, you know, a mission trip is about what we're going to do um, for the people, quote unquote, over there. But there's sometimes when a mission trip has a lot to do with the person who goes, and God uses it to do a great thing in their life. There's a second thing that we're doing. We're sending another team this week, and they're going to a city in Europe. We won't mention the country or the place because this is a high security event. And it's basically a a team that is going to minister to the children of our IMB workers. And so we're pulling together all of the IMB workers, all the moms and dads together for meetings, for medical work, and all these different things that they're going to be doing during this week, training and various encouragement. But what do you do with the kids during that week? Um, And so a couple of months ago, I got a phone call that said, from the, one of the guys who um, actually replaced Marcy and I over there, 
And Chad said to me, he said, Andrew, we had a church drop out. Uh, at the last minute, they were here two months before the thing starts, um, they've dropped out and we have no one to, to do our youth camp for these kids that are coming in from very hard places around the world and especially around the Muslim world. And he said, they need to have a good week. They need to have a good week of Bible teaching. They need to have a good week of relationship building, of being heard and being understood. Um, they're, they're kids just like anyone else and they need help. And so we had missionary kids, um, Cheryl Ann and Andrea, and we knew how much it meant to us when t people came over to minister to them. And he said, do you think you can do it? And I said, we'll pray about it. Yes, we can do it. And um, so uh, we, we talked about it, and um, a team is leaving on Thursday to go. And Pastor Ben is going to be leading that, um, as well as others that are going to be um, teaching there. But notice, what do we pray for them? It's totally different from the first team. One is high-impact, high-octane evangelism. The second one is, number one, um, is, is praying for this special youth camp um, for the kids from hard places. So look at this. Number one, pray for saving faith and turning to Christ for any kids who have not yet come to Him. Just because they're a missionary kid or an MK doesn't mean that they have actually surrendered to Christ. So we want to pray for them. And just so you know, outside of this place and outside of this thing, we don't call them missionary kids anymore or MKs. We call them TCKs or third culture kids, just because the word missionary is a difficult word to, to be using overseas at this point. Look at number two. Pray for our team to have God's wisdom and insight and sensitivity as they minister to the kids. So each one of our team members needs wisdom and they need insight on how to minister to these kids that are coming from different places. Look at number three, pray for the kids who are struggling with the hardships of adolescence and ministry life or mission life. Uh, you know, growing up is hard enough, but growing up in a place where there's rockets going over your head and mom and dad have to work a lot or whatever it is, it can be really tough. And um, there's kids that just, you know, right here in our church that we, we all struggle at different points. I struggled as a middle schooler. Um, many of you went through those difficult years. We're going to be ministering to them. We want this to be a rich time as we minister to them and who are struggling. We, we need to pray for those kids. Look at number four. Pray for the kids to develop a deep hunger and thirst for God's righteousness and truth. This is a good thing for us to pray for these MKs that they would hunger and thirst after God. Jesus said, blessed are you who hunger and thirst for righteousness because you will be satisfied. Look at number five. Pray for aha moments in spiritual breakthroughs as our team teaches and loves the kids. It's good. You remember times when suddenly something made sense spiritually or something made sense even logically or intellectually that helped you walk with God. I want to encourage you to pray for those moments as kids, as our team is saying something that their mom and dad have probably said a thousand times, we're just saying it a different way, and it will cause them to realize. Pray for that. Number six, pray for our team to be healthy and energetic <laughs> so they can complete this important task. Um, they're going to have long days and they're going to be very active. They need, they need to not be sick if possible, and we can pray for that. Number seven, pray for Ben and others as they teach the inductive Bible study method to their kids. So that's the core curriculum that we're doing. We're going to teach them to study the Bible. Some of you are saying, well, I need to learn what that is. Great. Um, hang around. Um, our ladies study it. Our men are going to be doing some of that this fall. Um, pray for the teaching material. Number eight, pray for God's protection from evil people and distractions from the aims of the conference. Um, yes, um, we need to pray for that. We need to pray that God would protect this meeting um, from those who would want to harm others. Number nine, pray our team is unified. In both of these teams, we need to pray for unity. Satan often loves to distract a mission team with disunity, and that's something that we need to pray for. Uh, number 10, pray for each of our team members to spiritually grow as a result of this mission task. So similar to the other number 10 is that we're praying for God to do a great work with these folks. Amen. Do you know what to pray? Do you have some things that you can pray? I want to encourage you to take this thing home. 
George, take this thing home and put it on the breakfast table. Bruce, take it home. Nietzsche, take this list home and pray during this time. Mrs. Molyneux, pray for these people. Pray for our team that we're sending out. One's going out on Thursday, the other one's going out on Friday. I'm going to ask right now that our praise team come, and we are going to sing a beautiful, beautiful song that expresses this desire that we would take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Holy Father, we joyfully send out these teams to preach the gospel. Some are going to the strangers who have not yet come to know who you are at all. Some have never seen or heard the gospel at all, but the gospel is going to come near to them because they're at the port gates. They're going to drive right by it or walk right by it. And Lord, how we pray that you would use this team in a powerful way. Father, we pray that you would give them boldness to speak the truth, to offer the gospel. Father, how we pray that you would give them a joy that would be detectable by those who pass by. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would give them an inner peace that when tiredness or circumstances intimidate, Lord, that they would have an inner peace that only comes from you, a peace that surpasses all human comprehension. We pray that you would give them words, even some of the words that they haven't yet learned. We pray that you would give them language and words that offer the gospel. Lord, we pray for Alex, who's there all summer right now. We pray that you would just bless him and give him grace, Lord, to lead and to learn. We pray that as our team arrives, that he would be able to have the joy of working with them for the sake of the gospel. And Father, I pray that you would bring many to Christ from North Africa and Europe. Lord, I pray that some would take the gospel to the most remote villages of Algeria and Tunisia and Morocco and Libya, and that your gospel would be known in those places. Your glory be declared. And Lord, for the other team that's going to minister to the children of our servants living in these hard places, Lord, how we pray that you would give them great sensitivity and great joy that the kids can detect. Lord, that they would feel loved and that there would be key conversations that maybe change and direct their life. Lord, I pray for the effort to teach them to study the Bible. I pray that there would be a great hunger in these kids' lives to, to learn how to really know what God's Word says and to study it for themselves. And so, Lord, this morning we come sending out these we love, asking that you would watch over them, that you would use them, that you'd prepare the way before them, and that there would be a great harvest for your glory and your glory alone. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. amen.